Well, good morning, Valley View. How are we doing this morning? Y'all doing good? Man, I just love our worship team. I love that I get to serve with them every week. That is the highlight of my week. Can we just give a big shout out? So uh, real fast, Pastor John sends his love. He and his family are enjoying some vacation time right now. So I'm very grateful that he models that for us as a staff, that he's going away highlighting the importance of family. Um, speaking of family, I feel like this morning is a family reunion for me because my parents, my parents are here. Uh, I've, I've got like Jody and Ben, they're all like family, Laura, uh, Adrian, uh, her best friend, Katie's here, Chris, my neighbor, my, my neighbor's there. Uh, so I mean, it's like a big family reunion this morning. So this morning we are going to, um, as it broke, but it's all good. We are going to, uh. We're going to jump into a, a word that I am super excited about. Um, I'm going to share from my heart. Now, listen, that's code for a lot of people that have left. I'm not leaving. Okay. If you've been around here for a while, you know what that means, but I'm going to share from my heart and, and be vulnerable about some things that I just recently have walked through and I'm on the tail end. And this is the ending of our series on free and fearless, which has been our keywords for the year. So can we, by the way, to Colby killed it last week with that message, didn't he? That was, man, I was absolutely loving it. I mean, it just did such a phenomenal job. I mean, it was powerful. It was packed full of, of just Jesus. It was amazing. So um, this morning, I want to start off by telling you a story about my life. Um, and then I'm going to tie it into our message today. Spring is my favorite time of year. I absolutely love spring. When spring rolls around, I love being outside cycling, being outside with my kids, mowing grass. I got bees this year. I've got my own hive. I'm going to be making honey. Some of you have come to me, want me to sell you honey. Others of you think I'm crazy, but I love spring. Spring is just, ah, the time of year for me that is just my favorite. Um, however, this year, as spring was rolling in, I was on these just all oh, loving it, loving it, loving it. And then suddenly, I began to have this downward spiral that I'd never really, I mean, I've dealt with something like that before, but not like this. And I couldn't figure out how I got there because I, I mean, when I say I love spring and this, I'm like so pumped. There's so much to do. I mean, as soon as the sun is up, I'm outside all day long, all the way till like the end of day. And then I just started getting into this, this, this downward spiral. And I mean, the only thing I knew to call it was like a kind of like a little bit of a midlife crisis. And it was around May that I began to experience this. And I didn't tell many people about it because one, I didn't even know what was going on. I just felt it. I just felt this chaos and I couldn't quite pinpoint it. And it all began with a thought. It all began with a thought and it wasn't a bad thought. It wasn't a sinful thought. It was actually a good thought, but it all began with a thought. So what I want to do this morning is I've got these great illustrations here that our team brought out for us. And these are our Jenga blocks. Okay. So you like my little Jenga blocks? I got to move things around here. So I want for representation's sake, each level to represent something in your life. So for me, I, I did this just for simplistic sake. I don't know if camera one can catch this. We'll just say health, family, finances, career, salvation. We'll just use it for different tiers. For me personally, it was one thought in one of those arenas. And it was just a thought. It was like, oh, you, you probably need to do this. And it was actually like, okay, the Lord's on this. This is cool. Maybe, or maybe he's not. I don't know. Just this thought was like, okay, cool. I need to do that. But then it went to another thought that then went to another thought that went to another thought that went to another thought. And how, I couldn't figure out how did I get here? So this morning, what we're going to do is unpack three stories in the scripture of thoughts that led to fear. All right, if you got your Bibles, open it up to Genesis 3. 
And more than just thoughts that led to fear, but thoughts that could lead to fear. It says in Genesis 3, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? For me and Eve, this is what was going on. The issues that I was struggling with, to be 100% honest, were original sin in the garden issues. And what was happening was the enemy was just throwing out these thoughts and looking for, oh, wow, wow. Look, there's a loose one right there. I can pull that one out. And then I'm like, how did that happen? I mean, it was a good thought. And then suddenly there's an open door to fear. There was an open door to fear. It's like, that was weird. And it was, it was one thing of like, oh, I probably need to do this with working out this and that. And then it was just like, well, what about this in your health? What about that in your health? What about this? And then suddenly I got this gaping hole that I didn't even know how I got there. I mean, it was a good thought initially. Then the enemy was like, oh, 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 there's another. There's another, there's another hole. The enemy did the same to Eve. He said, did God really say? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the tree, or excuse me, from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows when you will eat, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes, both of them were open and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed the fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Skip down to verse eight right here. And this is the thing that really I, I'm, I'm trying to, to, for you to catch up to this story. When the door opened for fear, they ran. They ran in shame. And God came looking for them saying, where are you? And their answer was, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. Here's the thing. God's not afraid of our questions, okay? He's not afraid for us going to him. But in this situation specifically, the questions Satan brought Eve were accusation that God was withholding from her. And she agreed with the fear and then the doors begin to open. Does that make sense? When we allow the enemy access, we have to give him access, okay? Sometimes it's through unforgiveness. Sometimes it's through lies we've believed. Sometimes it's through, but the enemy loves to go after our mind and just the thoughts. In an Eve situation, that's exactly what happened. Oh, did God really say? It was these access points. And that began to lead to this, where they begin to feel the shame. They begin to feel the fear that they had agreed upon. Somebody needs to get that phone call, apparently. For me personally, what began to happen in May this year was I began to let the enemy into my thought life, not knowing that it was fear. And it began to just take me down this downward, downward spiral to the point of, like every night for me to go to bed, I had to have Psalm 91 just playing over my brain just for my mind to shut up. I had to have my mentors pray over me, break stuff off, break agreements to try to figure out how did I get, and here's the thing, when the Holy Spirit brings a thought to your mind, there's a solution, okay? There's something there that there's a, there's a, there's a healing that needs to take place. There's a freedom that comes with it. But when our mind agrees with the enemy and there's not a solution, it's torment. And then what happens is all these holes begin to poke in our life. Everything begins, the enemy's just, oh, wow, wow, wow. You know, that one was easy. And he's looking for every little weak spot that he can pick at. Does that make sense? 
All right, jump over to Nehemiah chapter six. I'm gonna kind of give you a recap on this and then I'll break this down for us. As we're turning there, I want, I'm gonna throw out some, some thoughts here. Fear not is scripture is mentioned 365 times. It's one of the number one commandments. It is the number one commandment. Why? Because it's most needed. And you and I in our everyday lives can respond in one or two ways. We can respond in fear or we can respond in love. There is no in between. Do you understand that everything that you and I do daily, every interaction we have with our family, every interaction we have with our spouse, every interaction we have with our coworker, kid, is either response and love or fear. And what fear does is it drives our mind into forbidden territory. Does that make sense? It drives us into a place that we agree with the enemy and we give him access. And with this series that we're doing free and fearless, in order for you to be fearless, you have to address fear. You cannot say, oh, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be fearless, I'm gonna be fearless, I'm gonna be fearless, and not address the root issue. So what's going on in Nehemiah here, chapter six is this. Israel had been, their walls had been torn down for 70 years and what they could not do in 70 years with Nehemiah's leadership, they were able to rebuild in 52 days. Throughout the chapter, it highlights four different instances where the enemy attempted to frighten Nehemiah and discourage him from continuing on. Nehemiah mentions the issue of fear four times in this chapter. So let's jump, um, let's jump over to, all right, Nehemiah verse six, one. Production, I'm gonna jump around, so just heads up on that. Thank you. For this reason, he was hired that I should be afraid and act that way in sin so that they may have a cause of evil report and that they may approach me. I'm gonna break this down in my words. What was going on, Nehemiah's building the wall, and Israel's enemy comes to him and says, hey, look, man, we see what you're doing this thing. You know, I know we're your enemy, but, but we need to talk. We need to talk. Like, this is, you know, we don't like that you're building back your, your, your walls. You know, you, you haven't done it in 70 years, so we, we, we don't think you should. And what happens is in the way Nehemiah responds is, is he's saying, look, if I agree with the accusations, if I respond, it's the same as if I've agreed with it. Does that make sense? If you, if I say, if you're coming at me saying, Hey, I'm throwing these thoughts of fear at you. And if I partner with that, I'm going to open the very door of accusation towards me as if I had done it. Does that make sense? It's kind of like, um, my situation going back to this, when the enemy began to poke at my mind and looking for these open doors, it was honestly as if I had to come in agreement with those things. I hadn't, but it was just as if I did. And really what that was happening was I was enabling the enemy in those areas of my life. I was giving him authority in those areas of my life by my thoughts, by my agreements, by the fear that, I, that was going on. And let me just say this before I continue on this part. When fear happens and we, 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 have, we recognize it and see it, we have one of two options. We can either repent or we sin. Now, I really want you to get a hold of that. When fear creeps in, we have one or two options. Repent or sin. In my case, in this situation, I didn't realize that at first. I didn't take authority. I didn't have godly sorrow in those areas of my heart because they were all good thoughts initially. They were all reason. Are y'all tracking? Is this making sense? For me, I'm glad I have my mom and Jody out there. Um, my, mo my mom, I'll tell you this, all, all my basketball games uh, when I was in high school and all the stuff that you know I would send to like a recruiter or something like that for a scholarship opportunity, my mom was in the back of those videos yelling. So it's good to have her here with me this morning. Um, but uh, back to this, is, is this, these thoughts, I had to finally get to a point 
where if it felt like fear, if it looked like fear, I'm repenting. I'm just like, I, I, I can't go down this path. I can't, I can't go there. So let's go back here, Nehemiah. Let's go to verse one. Now it happened in Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of the enemies had heard that I had rebuilt the wall and there was no bricks left in it. Though at that time they had not hung the doors at the gates, then Sanballat the Geshem sent to me saying, come and let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to, to harm me. So I sent messages, messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work that I cannot come down from. Why should the work cease? Why should I leave and go down to you? But they sent this message four times and I answered in the same manner. So here Nehemiah is saying, look, I am doing this awesome thing. I got this thing going off of the Lord. I'm building this thing. When the messengers came to him and said, hey, will you come down and meet with us in this place of Ono? Which is really funny to me in scripture because you're like, the enemy wants to meet you in a place called Ono. I, I know that's a dad joke, but it, it, but you, you look at it and you're like, really? That doesn't. I mean, come on, enemy. We see your move here. You want to meet us in this place. But he's like, no, I'm doing a great work. Why should I stop what I'm doing? And can I just encourage us as believers? When the enemy comes to us, that should also be our response. Hey, I'm part of a community. Hey, I'm part of my family. I'm part of this. I'm doing these things for the Lord. Why should I stop what I'm doing? When those voices come in, and I'm going to be really straight up with you guys and say this. In May this year, I was pumped because I had all this fresh vision of things God showing me, showing me for here, showing me for things else I'm doing. And I partnered with fear. And it derailed me, distracted me from the things I was building for the Lord. Because let me tell you something. As believers, we are called to build. Okay? We're called to build families, community, we're supposed to bring the kingdom to every place. It doesn't mean you have to be on stage right here, but hey, if you cut hair, if you're a mechanic, if you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, if you're a firefighter, whatever, you're supposed to bring the kingdom into that. So we are building the kingdom, but when we partner with fear, we get distracted. And the, let me tell you this, the enemy doesn't mind you and I doing ministry if we do it in fear because we do it from a place of being powerless. We don't walk in the God-given authority that we received. We turn it over to do things from a weak place. Does that make sense? All right, back over here to Nehemiah. See, where was I? Okay. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. So they sit here and, uh, sorry, I got distracted there for a minute. I, I, was flow in there, but um, all right. So the enemy sends his note. Peter's response is, "Why should the great work stop while I come and talk to you?" What this means is that we're fully engaged, and I said that a minute ago. And everything the Lord has is doing. So here they said to him, "Come in with us," and he says, "No," and answers the same manner four times. We see this about capturing those thoughts, capturing those lies. And Paul addresses this in 2 Corinthians. He says, take every thought captive. So if you've got your Bible, open back over to 2 Corinthians. Um, where was that? 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. And even when I was preparing for this, I, I want to tell you this. I know I'm going to be a little bit all over the place this morning, but this is something that's got to be caught more than head knowledge. Does that make sense? Because I'm going to tell you, for me personally, this has been something that I wrestled with, well, since May, and I'm on the tail end of it, of trying to take every thought captive. St. Corinthians 10.5, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity of the obedience of Christ. Now, here's the fun part of this. I always thought that they'd take every bad thought captive. No, every thought captives. Do you know good thoughts actually try to exalt themselves above God? And they try to move us into different places of timing. You know, when, back to Eve, when Eve thought God was withholding, 
she withheld her trust, which then moved to her withholding her love, which caused the issues there, right? When I don't take every thought captive, sometimes good thoughts will try to exalt themselves above God and I will find myself out of alignment. And for me, that's what happened was all these things started happening, all these little, little holes in my life, this one there, that one there, and they just started popping and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And then guess what? When life brings the little shakings, the little struggles, where's my foundation? It can't, it can't hold. It's not stable. Unlike over here, when everything is patched up good, nice, tight, there's a solid foundation. Let me tell you something though, what's beautiful about the Lord. Psalm 23, it says his rod staff. One is there to guide, the other is there to correct. One is there to protect and the other one's to bring things into alignment. They guide and protect. So when those little holes begin to form in my life, I can be sensitive to his spirit. I can have his word so deep inside me. I can be so in tune with what he's saying. When something gets out of line and I feel it creeping, I repent, quick to repent, to patch that up. And do you know what? Repentance is not an event. It's a lifestyle. Repentance has got to be a daily thing. Because if not, when those things come, then you have a major crash. A major crash. And then you're like, oh, I don't know what happened. My marriage was good. Everything was solid. And now I let, you know, I had a phone call with a friend this week. He just walked through a divorce. And um, I said, bro, what happened? Like, tell me. So we stopped protecting our marriage. Really? He says, we were partying when we should have been doing missions. I'm fine with the vacations. Vacations are good. You need them. I'm about to go on one. I'm super pumped. But you have to be guarding those things because if not, your foundations, and then you find yourself where you should have been in a different place. And it's not about this prosperity message. I'm talking about building on the foundations of God, leaving a legacy, leaving things for your family, being a part of your community. You're not there. You're, you're over here back to square what? Oh, here I am. I'm trying to rebuild my own strength. When we have his presence, when we li- read his word, when we let it go deep within, when those things pop out, it's okay. Because his loving kindness draws us to repentance. And I just would let his word wash over me every night. And I was repenting of things I wasn't even sorry for, but I just was like, God, I pray godly sorrow there. I don't know. Maybe that's a bad thought. Maybe that's a bad thought. Maybe, maybe that's a good thought, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry, God, forgive me here. I'm sorry. I put this there. I'm sorry. I put that there. And every night, just letting his word wash over me. The last story that I want to highlight is Luke. When Jesus went to the wilderness, said, then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit, that's a key part. I want you to read that really carefully. Then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when he had ended, he was hungry. Colby and I were talking about this earlier this week at the office. I think it's funny. My humor funny. When Satan showed up, Jesus could have responded a lot of different ways. Because he had already dealt with them once in the beginning. Like really you? The analogy I like to use with my kids so they understand the power of the enemy verse, the power of God is I say, take a grain of sand and compare it to the ocean. So they can see that contrasting difference in size. That's Satan's power. I've turned around and look at the ocean. 
That's God's. But here's the powerful thing here. And the devil said to him, if you're the son of God, command these stones to become bread. But Jesus answered to him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil tried again. And Jesus answered to him, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Deacons, if y'all want to go ahead and get communion, that'd be great. And then he tried again. He says, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. He responded, being filled with the Spirit and with the Word. Being filled with the Spirit and the Word. Let me tell you something, as believers, we need both. Because if we don't have both, here's what's going to happen. If we respond with just the Word, there's a good chance we can fall into legalism. And if we spot just with the Spirit over here, there is a good chance we can fall into lawlessness. The two are anchors for us that we have to have together. Here's the thing. Jesus responded in a way and in a model form for you and I to grab a hold of. When Jesus resisted Satan, he was demonstrating what God could do. Excuse me. He wasn't demonstrating what God can do, but what God could do through a man submitted to the word and the Holy Spirit. It was for you and I. It was a model for you and I of how we were supposed to respond. It was something that was tangible. It was an example. I mean, he didn't, why, why, why did he respond that way? You, you know, it, I, I, this, is, this is Andrew's imagination here, but I envisioned him sitting there going, oh, I want to tell you a bunch of stuff, but I'm going to respond this way so that the people, and, and, I, and I love this thought, I'm going to respond this way because the ones that replaced your worship, I'm going to teach them how to defeat you. Because you remember when Satan went to him, was like, hey, what are you going to do? I'm your worship leader. Here I am. And, and, I, and I love this thought. Again, this is my imagination here. I could just see Jesus picking up a big, big thing of dirt with his dad up there in heaven and going, well, we're going to replace you with this. I will breathe life on this and this is going to take it your place. And this is going to be pure worship. So let's bring all these thoughts of what's going on this morning. There's three stories. There's Eve and how Eve responded was letting the enemy in and the fear. Okay. It was Nehemiah doing the good, the, the work of the Lord. Hey, look, I'm, I'm building, we're building these walls. And then there was Jesus who responded on the offense. And what I want to do this morning is ask communions being passed. I want you to ask Holy Spirit, how am I responding to fear? More than that, how am I responding to my thoughts? Because if I don't grab a hold of those first, fear's going to get a foothold by the open doors that I created through that. And, and that fear may be, maybe you're freaking out about your health. Maybe it's, your family, maybe there's an issue with your family that you're just like, maybe it's a thought that you're entertaining. Maybe it's that you both come from broken marriages and that you're thinking, will she leave or will he leave? Or will this happen? Will that happen? Maybe it's your finances. Maybe right now with the economy, the way it is, you're just panicking. What am I going to do? Maybe it's your job. Maybe you're going, well, is this where I'm at for the rest of my life? Is it, or do you have something different more? Or maybe you're questioning your, or your relationship with God is. And the enemies want to torment you with those thoughts.
So deacons, if you go ahead and pass communion, I want us to just posture our hearts right now. Ask God to search our heart. Where is their fear? Where have I given an open door? Where is there a place that the enemy has, has I've allowed him in and I haven't repented? You may think, it may be also, you may be thinking that this is, this is it for the rest of your life. God doesn't have anything better. So right now, just begin to ask the Lord, search your heart. God, search my heart. Is there any area you've called me to be, to build your kingdom? You've called me to walk fearlessly. You've called me to stand on the promises that you have. And, and maybe I'm entertaining thoughts I shouldn't entertain. Maybe I'm letting the enemy whisper in the night. And what happens a lot is we do good at first. We're doing, we're doing good. We're resisting, resisting, but then we grow weary. And we let his voice get so loud, we don't recognize the truth. So right now, all across the room, ask the Lord to search your heart. Ask the Lord, is there any area that you need his presence to come, his truth? And let me tell you, here's how we're gonna do this. If there's a lie that you've agreed with, Repent and replace it with truth. This is something that I've learned over the years from from those that are close to my life that have poured into me. If there's a lie, repent. If there's a fear that you've come in agreement with, repent. Just a few more seconds long. Don't reason it. Because the fear masquerades itself as wisdom. And it masquerades itself as reason. It tries to entertain thoughts. And only if the Holy Spirit is on those thoughts should you go there. But there's life with those. Not downward spirals, not spinning you out of control. Some of us, including myself, need more godly sorrow there. So Jesus, we ask for you to come. We ask for you to come. Convict our hearts. Let your loving kindness, let your word wash over us and cleanse us. Jesus. So you've got your communion in front of you. I'm gonna bless the body as blood. But here's what I want us to do. Lord, we thank you that your body was broken for us so we could be free. So Father, we bless your body. We thank you that it was broken so we could be free. Let's take up his body. Father, we thank you of your blood that cleanses us so we could be fearless. We thank you, Father, that your blood washes us white as snow. So, Father, as we repent this morning, we ask for your blood to wash over us. We love you, Jesus. Let's take up the blood. With every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here this morning and you want to say, Andrew, man, I'm still wrestling with fear. I'm wrestling with thoughts, accusations. Lift your hand. Okay, come on. All around the room. Who else? Who else? Look, I'm telling you my story. We all have a story right now. Okay. Here's what I want to do. We took of the body, we took of the blood. 
the washing, the cleansing, the repentance. I want to pray over you all this area. And then I want to celebrate together on the offense of declaring who God is. Amen. So if that's you right now, I want you to posture your hands in a place of receiving. Okay. Father God, right now, we just break off every lie, every accusation, every fear of the enemy. Right now, we curse it. We send it back to the pits of hell. We say, Lord, your kingdom come onto our lives. We give you access. Father, we repent. We repent. We take every thought captive to the knowledge of you. We repent. We repent. Stop oh, right now. Look, I'm just telling him what I'm getting from the Holy Spirit. Some of you right now, you're repenting and then you're reasoning. You're repenting and then you're reasoning. So right now, take those thoughts captive. Take those thoughts captive. Any thought that is trying to exalt, it could be a great thought. Any thought that is trying to exalt itself higher than the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, higher than the one that has you in the palm of his hands, higher than the one that knows every hair on your head, any thought that is trying to exalt itself higher than that right now, we take that captive because we are going to be known as a church and as a people that are fearless, that walk in authority through the blood of Jesus. God, it's your loving kindness. You just want to hold us. You want to be a safe and loving father for us. Well, just kind of the way we'll end this morning a little different because we, we've got people down here. I'd love to come and just pray with you guys. Um, Pastor John loves you guys. He'll be back soon. He's he's on vacation. But thank you all. Thank Colby. Um, we've got another guest this next week. It's going to be awesome. This Free and Fearless series, I pray that is ministered to you. I pray that you caught something. Even if things were kind of all over the place, I pray you caught something in your heart this morning. Love you guys. I pray blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace. All right. If you want.